And hello. Yep. Welcome to Connected Conversations with me, Scott. And today we have Lorenzo Washington, who um, honestly, I, I saw a swanky kind of guy and I was kind of like, all right, I got to get this guy on here. And so we can talk to him and see what makes him so swanky. Uh, and so I'm really excited to have uh, you here so we can uh, talk about this today. Everything that you do, I, I know you want to talk about your story and your research. Uh, we got some uh, images lined up, so it's going to be a, a wonderful time here. So uh, let's just start off and you tell us about yourself and uh, what what you do. Yeah. So hello, everyone. Uh, Lorenzo Washington here. And uh, I am currently a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley in the plant and microbial biology department studying plant biology. Um, and I, I think third year out here, almost four, so kind of nearing that halfway point in the program. Um, and I guess from that, you know, uh, I've always been a science nerd um, to kind of segue into a bit of my, uh, I guess, like origin story about being a scientist. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Texas, uh, Central Texas, a pretty uh, small rural area. And I, as like early as I remember, I've always just been kind of really into doing anything science related. I was like digging for fossils in my mom's rose garden. <laughs> Fortunately, she wasn't too mad about it. Um, anytime there was any sort of uh, exhibit or other science uh, kind of thing or like the children's museums, uh, my, my parents would take me to it on a regular basis. Um, and by the time I got into middle school, uh, I was already doing, I was trying to start to do like science projects. We had like a regional science fair. Um, and I was, I joked that I was so much of a nerd that I didn't even take band in middle school. I opted for a class called investigative science where we literally just did a bunch of science experiments and talked about the scientific process and, and, and came at it from so many different angles. Um, but to this day, I think that was one of the best decisions I've made. Um, and yeah, that was kind of, I guess, like my start. Uh, my start was really kind of just life, I guess. <laughs> so you're, you were much more the science nerd than the geek where you kind of did the band part. Yeah, okay. So which is, which is cool. Which is cool. And hello, Fluffy Potato Girl. Thanks for stopping by. Make sure you uh, give us any questions you have for Lorenzo while he's talking. Uh, so you've always had this passion for science. It wasn't something that kind of gradually built up. Um, it was just that curiosity was always there. Um, who was it in your life that kind of fostered that, that curiosity and kind of like kept you asking questions and being curious? Uh, you know, I really think it was just like a village effort for my family, to be honest. Uh, I was like 1000% the why child, like mm -hmm. for any, any reason I'd be like, why is it this way? Why and they didn't shut this? it down. They were like, keep asking, keep asking. Yeah. I mean, eventually they would shut it down within reason because, <laughs> you know, after the 50th why of the day, they'd be like, all right, it's just, it is because it is, it's cool. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, it, I, I was just super curious about how things worked. Um, and my parents, especially, I think did a, did a really good job fostering that, um, and not mm -hmm. kind of shut down. Uh, you know, they were actually some of the biggest reasons I was able to do early science projects. They, they were like, oh, you know, that we have this regional science fair, we know you're really interested in doing this stuff and you've been doing some similar things in school. So, you know, let's think about setting this up. Um, and you know, they, like I said, they would always take me to these museums. My grandparents would like find oh there's like a paleo uh, pale, uh, an archaeological dig going on um like two hours south let's go take the saturday off and and take lorenzo down there um and yeah i, I think my my whole family kind of pitched in to really just keep the curiosity going and, and keep finding hands-on things to keep me engaged with it and then uh by the time i got to high school i think the final nail in the coffin of like this kid's going on to science was uh, my high school uh, biology teacher. Uh, shout out to Mrs. Schultze. Um, and she was, uh, in my high school, we didn't have like super great science resources, but she still made the class super interesting. She had us like doing debates about different scientific topics 
and doing real hands-on experiments and really thinking about things. Um, and I took her again after my freshman year for an AP biology course. Um, and I was literally like, I didn't have a first period uh, the second half of my senior year because I had completed courses. And I would literally just, after my morning workout, come and sit in on her class and ask her questions and help her teach biology um, whenever she needed an extra hand. Uh, and it really just kind of solidified how much I love the scientific process um, and kind of going through that to figure things out and how interesting I found biology. Um, and I think honestly, because of her and, and, and all of that, uh, once I got to college, it was kind of solidified. Like, yeah, this is, this is the fun stuff. This is the this stuff. It's not like there's gets. any real question. It was kind of, it was kind of a given at that point. Um, that oh, yeah. biology was your thing, the way it sounds. I mean, I'd be, I would have been surprised if you had your first semester and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, you know what? I think I'm going to go, uh, with English, <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> or history. I, I think science was, was your calling, uh, for sure, for sure. Um, and you ended up at Texas A&M, right? That was your, your first, uh, foray yes, into... Yo. I'm not wearing the ring right now because I'm at oh, okay. work, but I gig them. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. And did you do, I mean, you did a lot of botany stuff when you were at Texas A&M. Did they have a big undergraduate research program there that you were involved in? Yeah. Uh, the undergrad research program is actually, I think, why I'm a plant biologist and not something else. Um, so I actually went in with the major of, sounds really fancy, but it's bioenvironmental sciences. Um, mm -hmm. It was just environmental sciences, but we used a more biological focus. So we talked about like plant pathology, um, consequences of like pollution and, and remediation processes. Um, but it was under this department called um, plant uh, pathology. So uh, my like first semester, I after my intro course or during my intro course, I talked to the professor teaching it about getting involved in the research because I knew um, that was kind of the more interesting part of science to me as opposed to just sitting in class and learning about it. Um, and he pointed me in the right direction to a lab. Um, and since then I was in um, sort of a plant pathology, plant microbe interaction type of uh, research environment as an undergraduate. Um, and A&M is fortunate enough, well, at least I think uh, A&M is pretty big. And so there's just a lot of resources and a lot of people doing research on campus. And I kind of stumbled into this area that was doing plant-based research, even though I had come in initially thinking I was going to do animal stuff. I actually, my other major was animal sciences. Um, and I majored in it explicitly because I wanted to go into like animal-based agricultural research. And then after about uh, eight months of doing, or two semesters of doing this plant research, uh, I was sitting in a lab meeting one day and they were talking about this paper uh, or this phenomena where plants like send out chemicals out of their roots to attack other plants. And it's kind of like a competitive warfare type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I realized I knew so little about plants and they were so cool that I had to learn more. Um, and I just kind of been stuck cool. since. Um, and Phoenix Stars is in chat now. I believe uh, Phoenix Stars is a high school student right now looking at science as an undergrad. So that's cool. Uh, you welcome to anyone nice. else in the chat. Please get questions out to Lorenzo if you have any um, and I think botany is great because they're easier to handle than animals you don't Absolutely. have to euthanize them you don't have to like deal with like you know the the nasty stuff that you do with animals you know there is some nasty stuff with plants but there is with animals too um, as far as collecting plants and in the field and stuff but that happens with uh, with, with animals as well so, and that really got you, so you're talking about as far as like the microbes and those interactions into what is now your, your PhD studies. So, um, you've kind of taken this all the way through from, you know, developing that interest as an undergrad into, uh, to graduate school and, and where is that right now? You want to talk about your research right now? We can get into that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I the program I'm in at Berkeley, uh, it's becoming more common that um, at least I think STEM programs are doing this where we have this thing called rotations. Uh, so our first year of our program, we're taking courses and we're just rotating in different labs for like, for us, it was 10 weeks. So we ended up doing three uh, or four, I did four rotations. 
Um, and so I came in having done like, oh, I did like plant pathology work, uh, you know, a, couple, a little bit of like plant beneficial bacteria type stuff. Um, but mostly, frankly, in my hindsight, from like a lab tech perspective, I hadn't really been kind of the driver behind it. Um, and then you come in and then it's like, okay, I can rotate in these different labs and see all this different research going on um, and see if what I'm really interested in. And so I, uh, uh, through these rotations, found out that I, I was really interested in getting better at molecular biology because I thought it was very important for future stuff, like everyone was doing it. And um, two, uh, I realized that the whole pathogen stuff is interesting, but from like the questions that I had been asking as a researcher in those labs, yeah, it felt more limited, I guess, in terms of like application and, and where the research is kind of going. And then I, uh, for my last rotation, actually stumbled upon the lab that I'm in now, the Scheller lab. And there was this kind of subset of projects going on that was exploring how uh, the plant cell wall, right? So plant cells are a little different than um, animal cells in that they have an kind of an extra layer of protection, the cell wall around them. It also helps with providing structure and other things for the plant. And they were curious with how, or this particular uh, kind of researcher was curious with how the cell wall is involved in um, influencing these relationships with beneficial microbes. So um, a lot of people I think are at this point familiar with like how humans have a microbiome, right? So we have this community of uh, like bacterial, fungal, all sorts of microbial life living on and inside of us. and depending on your perspective on biology, they're actually kind of the same as just us as an individual, right? They're part of us as an organism. Um, plants are the same way, uh, but because they're plants, you know, th there's no like stomach tract or anything, no skin, it's a little different. Um, and so, you know, one of the, in my opinion, really fascinating things that we've started to figure out in the last like three or four decades in research is these microbiomes or especially certain players or like uh, certain microbes in these microbiomes for plants do kind of really remarkable things. Um, so instead of having like, oh yeah, we have a group of bacteria that helps the plant digest stuff. It's kind of like, oh, there's a particular kind of bacteria that can pair with this plant and it grows a whole new organ that produces fertilizer for the plant in exchange for sugars that the plant makes in, in the root system. There's also an even, uh, to me, slightly more fascinating one, it's very similar, where plants pair with a fungus, um, and this fungus grows into or onto the plant roots and trades resources, so like minerals um, and water, in exchange for sugars and fats from the plant. And this fungus is so like evolved into this niche that they actually rely upon the plant for all of their resources. Um, and it's so widespread that like seven, I think 80 to 90% of plants you see on land are able to do this. Um, and our current understanding of how old it is and with like evolutionary processes um, makes us think that, or there's a high probability that plants actually had this relationship with this fungus before they even had roots. So this fungus was kind of like the OG root system. And then plants were like, oh, this works really well. We should evolve our own. <laughs> um, and so I'm, uh, my work is OG root system. Okay, got that. OG root system. <laughs> yeah. It's a great way to put it. Now, it, it's very interesting. I've also heard um, that this is one of the problems that happened as a result of the green revolution in monoculture is that we lost a lot of the endemic species, you know, and with those species we also lost even if you could get you know the seeds you might not get those microbes back that would enable those plants to grow or grow well um, if you were to try to grow them again so it's kind of like the you know the seed vault you have all these seeds but do you really have the environment that will enable them to be successful and grow so that's really interesting questions yeah I mean, precisely. I, I, I think to me, that's one of the more exciting, I guess, kind of developments that comes from research like mine and, and research in this field is that it's kind of signaling this perspective shift in how we do agriculture. Um, I think previous 
perspectives of agriculture, at least since the Green Revolution, has been that, oh, humans can do, like, we're good at this. We, we can take this plant and we can bring out the absolute most that this plant needs. But we're thinking about the plant strictly as an individual, right? It's mm -hmm. strictly its own, it's strictly how it reacts to the environment in isolation by itself. Um, and that's a side effect of a couple of things, right? One, we literally didn't have the tools to even know about these processes to some degree, right? Um, or know about them as well as we do now. And two, it's just kind of like, you know, you find something that works and you're gonna run with it. Uh, the downside is sometimes you don't find out that it's not working as well as you think it is until much later, um, especially with things like plants that take time uh, to do this work with. But uh, kind of the, I think the side effect of us you know, starting to figure out how important these communities, these microbial communities in the roots, on the roots, in the general plant, on the general plant, all of this um, in the broader soil can really have such a drastic effect on, uh, on how well the plant can grow. And also from the, you know, kind of more scientific perspective, we can then turn around and find out how to apply this to kind of just be a lot better at agriculture. I use the term of like strength in numbers so we're basically just recruiting new teammates into our mm -hmm. agricultural process. Humans used to do this solo, and now we're realizing that there's tons of other forms of microbial life that have been helping plants and to this day help plants do this. We just have been neglecting them. And so if we can understand them better and then in turn understand how to apply these relationships into environments that we want them to, like agricultural systems, um, you know, like just out, uh, like, you know, uh, whether we're doing kind of traditional stuff or, or, or newer type things. Um, it, it really provides a lot of interesting new ways to do agriculture. And uh, also they tend to be much more sustainable because, uh, you know, we don't have to make as much fertilizer ourselves, which that's a whole process. Um, and if uh, they allow for a lot more uh, efficient um, utilization of uh, other things like herbicides and pesticides, uh, or rather, sorry, counteracting the need for herbicides and pesticides as right. much. Right. Now, so, let me ask you a question about the cell wall, All right? Since yeah. you're kind of an expert on the cell wall. Now, as a, a trained biologist myself, right, you the plasma membrane gets all the attention, right? Because that's got all the you know, it's semi-permeable. You got all, every, all the proteins and stuff in it to allow communication and everything. But the cell wall is always just the cell wall. That's all it is. Is it really that simple? Or is there more to a cell wall than just collagen? You know, I mean, there, there's got to be something else involved in a cell wall. Oh, yeah. Uh, at this point, being in a cell wall-based laboratory, I'm fully convinced that it's it's far more important than uh, the kind of level of understanding we have, um, our current scientific level of understanding allows us to perceive it as. I mean, when you think about it from like, to draw an analogy, right? Uh, it's kind of like the skin of this, well, no, this might be not a great one, but in a way it's like the skin of a cell, right? It's, it's the most outer layer that this thing has. Um, but we also know that because, you know, these are, individual cells we're talking about. These are butted up against each other. And as the plant grows, as new organs develop, all these things happen, the cell wall, which you could perceive as a very static object, right? It's just a, a, lot, a lot of these sugars and compounds locked together. It needs to shift and it needs to change. And uh, being able to do that requires a lot of very interesting kind of genetic, uh, I guess, toolkits the plant has to use. And, um, and that's just for like growing and like, like really basic, uh, quote unquote, basic kind of processes we're thinking about. Um, for me, where I think it's like super understudied is uh, how it plays into how the plant interacts with other forms of life. Because it, anything that needs to grow into the plant, anything that needs to be taken inside the plant for this relationship to work has to get past the cell wall somehow. Either the plant needs to let it happen or it has to force its way in. And so from the plant needing to let it happen perspective, um, you know, there's a lot of, I guess it's like signaling potential and a lot of things where the cell wall is probably really important or the cell wall is really important for like early stage things happening. Um, and we kind of take for granted like, oh yeah, I got past that. And then all this other stuff happens, but it's like, 
a lot of things can go wrong in that early stage. And then from a uh, getting sick perspective, right, the, the plant has a, a really remarkably efficient or a really mar remarkably um, sensitive ability to detect when its cell wall is being degraded against its own will. Hmm. Um, and so I kind of, that kind of, I guess, leads me into talking about how the cell wall is really this, this you know, it's not just cellulase, right? Um, cellulase being a, a particular kind of a really strong sugar bond or, or a really strong sugar that's bonded together. Um, right. It's comprised of a lot of other different molecules that are really varied. So there can be all kinds of proteins and all kinds of different sugar uh, residues. And all of these could potentially have benefits as far as like signaling, as far as other downstream um, effects. So they can trigger other kinds of genetic reactions. Um, but it's just, it's so heterogeneous. It's just kind of hard to, to get started. And I, I think a lot of the research now is kind of starting to unravel that space and have a better understanding. Right. You would think that if you're, you're signaling, because that's usually thought about being done with a cell membrane, that that's not going to work because that's not the outside, right? The cell wall is the outside and the cell wall has to have some way to say, hey, fungus, I'm ready for you. You know, come give me some minerals. Um, and in that for that reason, your root cells might have a different cell wall than, of course, your leaf, right? They'd be diversified somehow. They're Like you said, they'd be, you know, heterogeneous. They're not going to be the same. They would be different in many ways. That's There's so many questions you could ask there. And you're kind of mentioning, you know, getting at, we don't know, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyone else that's watching right now, you want other good research, right? This is an area where it's extremely beneficial. And it's a lot, lot of really good basic science can be done with this. It's, it's exciting. Um, so, uh, what, what are your next step? Like, what is the question that you're asking in your research? Yeah. So sort of the specific question slash questions I'm asking are, uh, I have these, uh, kind of mutants that I've selected with the, with the model species that I use, which is a cute little grass called Lotus japonicus. Um, if you've ever seen alfalfa, it looks kind of mm -hmm. like that. Um, it's pretty unassuming if you just walk past it. But um, it's able to, it's a legume, so it forms nodules, which are those organs I talked about where the bacteria make fertilizer. So it can do that. And it can also form that relationship with that fungus. So because of this, I can study both processes and they also happen to share uh, a core genetic pathway. Um, so understanding kind of what elements are shared between these two kinds of uh, relationships are really important too, because we're still kind of getting the full scoop on that. Um, and I, I want to know how these specific mutants are uh, impacting this process. And my mutants are involved in cell wall composition. So I have uh, three mutants that each kind of change the, uh, or sh theoretically, I need to like validate this as I go into studies, but theoretically should be changing how the cell wall is um, composed, like what kind of a particular kind of sugar is being added. And so then, okay, this cell wall is less in an arabinose type sugar. So does that have any difference? Oh, if it's not arabinose, what if we check a galactose type sugar? Does that have a difference? Um, and I also have mutants in these, uh, actually in the plasma membrane process as well. Um, but these are a, uh, it's a, it's a kind of molecule called a sphingolipid, which is a combination of a, uh, trying to make this not super sciencey because it's got a really long sciencey name, but um, they're a combination of a fat and sugars basically. Um, and the way they work is uh, they form actually a really large amount of the plasma membrane that ends up being like 40% in some plant species um, and also poorly understood, kind of a newer area of research. Um, but because they have these sugar residues on them, they can be super diverse in structure. Mm -hmm. um, so as a scientist, that keys you into, oh, there's a lot of potential application for the plant here. If these, you know, there can be a, a wide diversity of structure, there has, there's likely some kind of reason to there being a wide diversity of structure. Um, and uh, there have been some studies uh, also done in this lab in the past 
that have shown that um, at least uh, some kinds of these can be important uh, for having a normal infection or a normal sym symbiotic process with the fungus and the um, bacteria in this case. And so uh, I also have three mutants in that process um, for each different uh, kinds of also sugar residues on these lipids or on these fats. Um, and then seeing how that affects. And then finally, I also have mutants in the in signaling processes. Um, so kind of past the cell wall, past the plasma membrane, and then into how the plant perceives signals. Um, I have a one mutant that's like uncharacterized, which means no one's really figured out what this does yet. And I'm the person trying to figure it out. And then a couple others where we know pretty well where this affects things. Um, and so for me, what that gives me is kind of a, uh, a control of sorts. I know what to expect with this. Um, and uh, so uh, it can help inform me if what I'm doing is working well or not. Um, and that's just kind of like, I guess, the early stage. And as with everything, PhD projects are always ambitious. And so the late stage, what I want to get to do is once I found out if these do affect um, these uh, symbiotic relationships from forming normally, I want to find out if they also affect how the bacterial community that just hap that grows around the roots um, for is composed, right? So that bacterial community can be uh, of an assortment of different bacteria. In the lab setting, we'll have what we call a synthetic community. So it's a we've kind of handpicked a smaller amount of bacteria, so we have greater control over the experiment. And one of my uh, kind of experiments that I really want to get to is seeing what happens when we have these mutants that in some cases might be affecting the symbiotic process, in some cases might not have any sort of obvious effect on them. Mm -hmm. And then in combination with the different symbiote, uh, in combination with like the fungus or that symbiotic bacteria that forms nodules um, or both of them, when we have this mutant, does it change how the plant forms this, the rest of this bacterial community? Um, because, you know, from my perspective, there's this kind of shared core genetic pathway between that fungus and that bacteria that both uh, kind of have that really drastic process of getting nutrients for the plant um, in exchange for sugars. The others don't necessarily do that, but the plant still has to be able to perceive them, and it still has sort of a selection process. As we've seen that plants can either... Um, well, we've seen that plants can sort of select, for lack of a better word, the members of this community. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the plants having this shared process for having this really specific kind of selection system, I'm wondering if we have anything that can impact it. Does it also impact how they comprise this kind of, I guess, less special, for lack of a better word, group of bacteria that uh, mm -hmm. grow with it? So it's kind of like if you take a plant you know and you and you put it in the ground will it change the funguses and the microbes that are in the ground where you put it or would it not change at all i mean i guess that's kind of a, a simple thing you would think that if you have that plant it'll foster that community of microorganisms and have it go a certain direction is that kind of like what we're, we're talking about yeah, precisely. I, I want to see if that community that it fosters, if it changes between these mutants right. in the cell wall and the plasma membrane and then the signaling processes. Right. That's very involved. <laughs> it sounds oh, yeah. simple, right? But there's so many players involved, right? There's so many different species of funguses and, and microbes. And you, know, you have the one species of plant with the mutant, but like you take a, any clump of dirt and there's like so much stuff in there uh, that you kind of have to control for, you know, in a way and kind of know what it is. I guess that's where you rely on everyone else's research to kind of know, you know, what it is that you have in there and, and how it affects it, hopefully. <laughs> See how oh, yeah, basically. absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a team effort for sure when it comes to academic research or any research in general, honestly. Yeah. So you have some pictures. I want to get some pictures. Yes. This is a video, this is a you know a a visual medium here. So uh, we're going to try to see if we can get some uh, some images up. We'll do that in just Let's a see. second. And uh, 
engage the audience with some uh, all right visuals. see if we can yeah. do this so all right. i guess first off uh Hold so the this. bacteria right. that i was talking about um that does that uh, relationship where it grows into these roots and then the plant sends it sugars and it basically takes nitrogen in the air and turns it into nitrogen fertilizer for the plant so you can imagine it as like if humans grew lumps and these lumps gave us food if we like drank enough water for them or something like that <laughs> um kind of phenomenal honestly uh plants just figured out how to kind of cheat the system and instead of having to get their own stuff other people can make it for them um and the reason it's kind of unsettlingly red inside of it is because of uh heme so heme being that uh you know chemical in our blood that binds oxygen huh, um, interesting yeah yeah the, so the process that they actually fix nitrogen with so that they how they take the nitrogen and turn it into fertilizer uh, is inhibited by oxygen so um, plants have to kind of find ways around this because naturally they also need oxygen to survive um, so one of the ways they do it is by have having their own kind of heme there to bind the oxygen um, if you ever eat an impossible burger it's the same heme they actually took it out of a soybean um, and that's what they use to give it it's kind of like meaty color well, and, and there you go it. there you go yeah you'll learn something uh, and the image on the left is just uh you can see what these look like uh from like a microscope perspective and all the pink matter is the plant tissue and then all the blue stuff is bacteria growing inside of it um and so these bacteria have kind of already undergone this process of turning into what we call bacterioids which means they just kind of changed a little bit from what they would look like in the soil um and now they're in a state where they can actually fix that nitrogen um for the plant and and take up sugars from it instead of just doing what they do when they're out in the soil so hmm. uh, now how do they get yeah. in there so it depends on the plant uh but a pretty common way they do it is either just getting in through cracks in the root so um as plants grow there's like you know bits and pieces like as humans if you don't moisturize or something your skin starts to crack they can get in that way um one of the uh, kind of more common ways they do it is they'll actually uh get really close to the root because they perceive there's this whole like uh signaling dance right uh that they do before they get um to start this thing where the bacteria send out signals and the plants send out signals and they each respond to each other and so they're like oh yeah this is uh this is the right setup um and then once that happens the root hairs so roots actually have hairs which are these tiny mm -hmm. um cells that grow out really far to um, increase surface area and whenever the bacteria are uh, within the area of these root hairs they start to curl and so as they curl they uh, envelop the bacteria oh, and then the plant wow. really absorbs them into um, that root hair and then they start this whole fascinating process where they make a whole uh, they kind of like grow and extend this plasma membrane cell wall down into the rest of the root um, where the bacteria uh, where the cells start re-entering the cell cycle and changing into nodules and then the nodule grows and the bacteria get in that way so it's a very like controlled kind of situation the plant yeah. has absolute like fine-tuned ability to to allow this oh. to happen and not happen millions of years to do it so <laughs> oh yeah like 70 million i think with this one so they'll, they'll figure something creative out plants are a lot smarter i think than we give them credit for uh and then uh, let's see so this is the bacteria um that i study but then the fungus i study uh looks a bit uh these are some better images it looks a bit like this so let hmm. me find my favorite one which is this one so these are images i took on the microscope uh I think I took these back in December. Um, and so this is a plant root you're looking at. You can't actually see the plant root. Um, all the green you see is actually the fungus. So I stain these uh, after a preparation kind of thing. Um, and so the stain lights up whenever it binds to fungal chitin. Um, and so the way this fungus works is so 
similar to how that bacteria kind of has a special way of growing into the root, the fungus has a very similar process. So they make contact on the root surface after that whole signaling dance. And then that like really special plasma membrane grows into um, the root down into kind of the middle part. Um, and then they start to grow all these kind of structures you see. So these really bushy things you see here that look a little bit like treetops are called arbuscules. Hence, because they look like trees, they got termed with a tree-like name. Yeah. Um, and these are actually fungal hyphae, so uh, the fungal cells that have um, grown out into really bushy structures to increase surface area. And that's where they trade all their minerals and nutrients and they take up the sugars and fats. So these are like, uh, I think I've described them as farmer's markets before. <laughs> Um, because they, they constantly get broken down and built back up in different parts of the root. Uh, and so this is where you're, you're seeing the trade going between the plant and the, and the fungus. Um, and then these kind of eyeball looking circular things you see here, uh, this one to the left, um, that's a vesicle. So it's just like a, a storage okay. bubble for the fungus basically. Um, and yeah, and it, it grows all throughout the root system. Um, and uh, let's see if I can find a better image showing just how much it can grow into it. I mean, it's um, pretty much any empty space, empty quote unquote space is filled with fungus, it looks like. I mean, it's like yeah. every cell wall has some fungus on it. Yeah, so they, they grow entirely like, a, so when the cell walls are all butted up against each other inside the plant, there's actually spaces in between them, very small spaces in between them. We call it the apoplast. Uh, you can imagine it if you're like looking at stones on a mo on like a on a pathway, right? It's like you have those gaps between the stones, um, and it's like that. And the fungus grows through that. So if you ever see like a really mossy pathway, it's kind of like that situation. Um, and it only enters those cells, so it only goes into an actual cell um, to make an arbuscule or to make a vesicle. So uh, otherwise it's just growing technically not inside the plant from the plant's perspective. Um, so uh, again, allowing the plant to have a bit more control and keep this fungus a little distant in case things get dicey. Um, because you know we are talking about life and life isn't always pretty, um, especially when you're a plant growing just where you happen to sprout. Um, but yeah, they kind of end up taking a remarkable space, like a remarkable amount of space in the root, as you can see, um, like of all the root in the image here, you know, they're covering like most of it. And I think I have another one. Um, you can see here better, like arbuscules actually kind of popping out here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's like it's got and, acne or something. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, another fascinating thing about this relationship is that, uh, a single plant can do this with multiple different fungi. So it's not just like a one-to-one -one pairing, right? Um, it can have like multiple of these growing up and down its roots. Um, and a, a single fungus can be pairing with multiple different plants. So just basic math, you start to realize how connected these networks can be um, right. depending on the environment that the, the plant and the fungus is in. Um, and it kind of starts to change how you think about ecosystem dynamics out in the wild. Because if, uh, you know, if there's a, you know, if there's like a bunch of plants growing around and initially you're like, oh yeah, they all trying to make their own sugar, trying to make their own, you know, food and, and get by, it's whatever. But turns out there's this system underground that's helping them get nutrients. And because they're all kind of tangentially connected, uh, they can actually effectively share nutrients. The fungus can kind of direct this, um, the sugars and the fats it gets in this process um, and potentially give them to the plant, or it can take nutrients from an area where there's a bunch of them and take them to a place where there's not a lot and a plant might struggle to be growing otherwise. Right. Um, so it kind of really changes, I think, at least from my perspective, how you think about right. um And I think this is more, has become more known with trees because I, I was I did a lot of forest ecology stuff when I was in my younger years, um, and it was always put out there like, oh, the trees are competing with each other. You know, they're trying to get one's going to try to get more water than the other. One's trying to get more sunlight for when they grow. And it turns out, like you said, 
that they're helping each other more than they are competing. But of course, they're not helping so much as, you know, all the microbes that are in the soil are aiding in that mutual benefit for, you know, all the plants that are involved. So it's really a change in how biologists thought about the world, you know, and how life interacted at a fundamental level. You know, instead of it being, you know, competition, it's all symbiosis and mutualism and, you know, looking out for one another. Yeah. <laughs> touchy feeling. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's a little, it's almost funny uh, when you think about it. I think it's like, you know, all this early kind of scientific thought around biology was uh, kind of human centric. Well, I mean, it's inevitably human centric because humans are the ones doing this work. But naturally, we're like, oh, everything's competing. You know, it's got to survive. And, and to a degree, it is. But it's like, the more we understand about what kind of life is out there and the way it's working, the more I think we just consistently see that it's like, life has managed to get by by figuring out how not to work alone. Like, right. over and over. Again. It's figuring out how to front some part of the struggle of living, share that with something else. And in the process, both benefit. So it's kind of like the name of the game when it comes down at the end of the day. Um, and the fact that I am at a time where it's becoming more and more common uh, for us to look into this um, in the plant sciences is really exciting to me. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be in it at, at, at such a time. Yes, because you can get grant money for that. That's good. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Versus that research topic no one cares about right now, so you can't get funded. <laughs> It's a good one. You've picked well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, let's see if I, is there another image? Oh, I guess this one's not as special, but this is actually a spore. Um, is that a, so, singu a singular spore, just one? It's a singular spore, but there's like multiple different fungus potentially inside of it. Um, okay. Like, uh, I don't know how to... Fungi are weird. Um, you can think of it like a seed with seeds inside, I guess. Uh, okay. But um, yeah, so the the fungus, uh, like I said earlier, is actually completely reliant on plants um, to complete its life cycle. It needs to get in them to take all these resources. It needs to grow and then connect to other plants. Um, and then eventually it forms spores, but it can only do that by growing um, into these plants and getting these resources. Uh, and then, yeah, I think, oh, these are, I guess, some better images. You can see sort of how that, um, how the fungus is growing through the root here. Uh, not as clean as the other ones, but, um, nonetheless. It's still pretty cool. Uh, still pretty cool. I stare at these images for hours, both for work and fun. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a, it's a good time. Now is this bioluminescence? Is this the you're attaching the the protein and then illuminating it that way? Is that how we've done this? Uh, the glowiness. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, yeah bioluminescent um, kind of marker where uh, I think in for this particular one it binds to um, a particular residue that is only found on uh, fungal tissues in high concentrations. Um, and so you have to like do this whole prep process where you clear out the root. So I basically just like bake it in a really basic, um, solution for like a day or two. Uh, and then that kind of cleans out all the cytoplasm and all this other stuff, but the, the walls and everything else remains intact. And then, um, I get it to the right pH and then soak it, um, in a solution with this dye and about a day or so later. Um, I'll look at it under a microscope, and if I look at it under green, blue light, uh, I'll see these nice, shiny um, images where I can actually see where the fungus is both on and inside the root. So, And I will say for any of the high schoolers in uh, that are watching this ever or anywhere else, if, if you're going into like molecular stains, dyes, um, and techniques for, for tagging specific proteins is like, one of the your your bread and butter in the field really uh to know Absolutely. when gene expression occurs so uh 
depending on what you do, will will determine the technique that you use um, and what you want to see. But uh, so I had a histologist on, you know, a few weeks ago, and he was talking about his staining techniques for you know looking at nucleuses and things like that. So every you know molecular biologist has their own skill set when it comes to uh, staining and dyes and uh, you know detecting proteins. Yeah, it's uh, kind of the name of the game when you can't actually see what's going yeah. on with your own eyes. You kind of got to find ways to help you. So, yep. Now, at this point in the show, uh, we're going to play a game. And mm -hmm. uh, in this game, uh, I'll be asking you three questions, and hopefully, you will get two out of three of these questions correct. Now, um, you are a researcher and you investigate the relationships of roots. So I thought I would ask you questions about the roots of relationships. Mm. So these are all questions about love and relationships as we're exiting uh, February here. Um, get two of these questions right and someone in chat will get a, a sub, will gift a sub out. Are you ready? All right. Yes. All right, we'll see what you know about relationships. According to Jonah Lair in a book about love, research shows that online dating doesn't work because of what? Is it A, the majority of those looking for love online have narcissistic tendencies, which in the long run don't equal successful relationships? Is it B, similarities between people really don't matter, what we want in life and what we want in a spouse are mismatched? Or is it C, evolutionarily visual social cues have played a huge part in establishing relationships and in online dating, when you're removed from those social cues, you don't have adequate information to vet a potential mate. Ooh. So why does an huh. online dating work? Is it A, they're narcissists, so it's not going to work because they're all online. Is it B, uh, you're actually more, you don't want to be similar, you want to be different, so you're mismatched. Or is it C, evolution? You got to be able to see your, your uh, potential mate. Oh, it's a bit of a tough one. Mm. I think I'm going to go with... The scientist in me says go with C because that makes sense from what I understand of like behavioral sciences. It's actually B. Dang it. Ugh. Uncle Bill Drew, it's actually B because the algorithms they use on these matchmaking services always match people that are similar, which doesn't work. You actually, research has shown that you are, you have to be with someone that's different than you because you would drive yourself crazy, <laughs> I guess. That's a very good point. Dang. So I changed it at the last second. I shouldn't have done it. Oh well. I put that one in there just to get you. I was like, I want to put an evolution one in there. That might be the case. I don't know. But uh I'll, I'll take further research to see that. Hey, Nikita Burroughs is here. Thanks for stopping in. Hello. Uh all right. Question two. All right, you got two more chances. Right. Uncle Bill says pairs need to be complementary, not the same. According to author Mark Manson, which is an indicator of a healthy relationship that some people think is toxic? All right, something that's healthy, but some people think is toxic. Is it A, the ability to admit that you find other people attractive and have your partner be okay with it? Is it B, Keeping score and a you know tit for tat you know record keeping, but as long as you don't say anything, it's okay. Or is it C, blaming your partner for your emotional status? It happens all the time, and often your partner is responsible for your, you know, lack of positive feelings, anyways. Mm. So I'm a, gonna go with B or C. Yeah. 
I hope I'm not wrong here, but I, I feel like it's A, because I feel like part of a healthy relationship is understanding that you aren't like absolutely 100% what your partner needs at all at every time. So I'm gonna go and with A. And you are correct, right? Yes. A. So some you might think that, you know, it's got your partner shouldn't be looking at other people, but it's healthy to admit that, uh, yeah, you find other people attractive and, you know, be okay with it. After this show, everyone's going to be awesome in relationships, by the way. <laughs> this is great. Taking notes out here. <laughs> Taking notes. All right, question three. All right, this is it. You got one right. This is your, your chance to win it. So courtship is that beginning bond of relationships. Now, which one of these is a real courtship ritual that um, has happened? Is it A, in 19th century rural Austria, eligible ladies would keep an apple slice crammed in their armpits during dances. And at the end of the evening, the girl would give her used fruit to the guy she most fancied. And if the feeling was mutual, he would eat it. Or is it B, in China, when women would come of age, they would wear a sash and suitors would put a food item in that sash. If she ate that food item, she would show her interest. Otherwise, she would throw it at him. Or is it in Germany during the 19th century, uh, there wasn't much privacy. So to aid in courtship, Lovers would use a six-foot courting tube called the Sprechensprunge, so the couples could exchange sweet somethings while other family members could talk around them and not hear what they were saying. Oh. Mm. These are all delightfully just kind of left field. So let's see. Is it A, the Which apple slices? Is it B? The uh, in China, the woman would throw the food at the the guy that she doesn't like, or is it C, the Sprechensprunge, the long tube? Dang, I I feel like it might be B. You sure but, about that? But like even Uncle Bill doesn't know. He's guessing. He doesn't know. Yeah, would people waste food like that? I don't know. I feel like B because I feel like they gotta they gotta give women the ability to throw food at men occasionally. I think we deserve it um, sometimes. So it was not B. It was A. Oh, it was A? That's just yeah. A. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I will say the other two are variations on things that would act that actually happened. They're, they're I changed them slightly, uh, oh, I see. but uh, but you know, B I completely you know made up. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the armpit slices. Like like once that tradition died, I think all the guys were probably like, "Thank God, <laughs> why was that ever a thing?" Oh my gosh. I mean, yeah. you must really like that woman if you're eating that apple slice. <laughs> yeah, I guess they figured it's a surefire way to find out if you're okay with them. Yeah, I mean, you eat that, you're you're bonded already. I mean, that's that's nasty. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, man. Oh, can you imagine being alive back then when you had that kind of stuff? Oh, my God. I don't know if I'd rather that or have to internet date, though. Internet dating is scary to me. Thank God I've been married for as long as I have. Yeah, I'm fortunate that I I, I got lucky and met my partner on, like, a random bus ride. So there I had a go. classic sort of situation as opposed yeah. to the... Isn't that kind of a relief <laughs> in a way? Oh, yeah. I'm happy I never had to, like, use Tinder more than, you know, like a month of my life. Uh, like, it just it's a whole other kind of playing field that... It's just a lot of things going on. Yeah. So. Especially nowadays in COVID. Oh, God. It's like, oh, yeah. I, I can't even. You'd need the, the Sprechensprung, the six foot 
the like tube where you can like talk to each other through it <laughs> some six feet First away. First time you're like outside. you're only transmitting disease from one person to another. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, hilarious, funny, funny. I have a lot of fun making those. That, that's hilarious. Yeah. So, uh, so what's what's next for you this year? What else is going on? You have other your know, webinars you're doing, symposiums. You know, where can people find you? What do you, what's up? Yeah. Uh, let's see. So I do have a, so one, I have an article um, that I had written for a local nature magazine coming out. I don't, I'm not hundred percent sure what the online thing is, but if anyone's living in the Bay area and happens to uh, be a subscriber for Bay nature magazine, I'll have an article talking all about um, the uh, fungal relationship, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that I talked about. Um, that should be coming out here toward the end of March. And then I'll also be having a talk through Wonderfest um, Science. So if you Google Wonderfest Envoys, um, you'll, you should get pulled up to like a page. Uh, I should be one of the people on there. Um, and I'll be giving a 20 minute talk about my research or like my research field and its implications, uh, I believe on April 14th. Um, a bit late though, unfortunately for the East Coasters. Um, let me double check that. Yeah. So I think it's going to be like at 8 PM Pacific, unfortunately. Hmm. Uh, but those are like the two, uh, definite, I think kind of like bits of research you'll see from me, um, and bits of communications you'll see from me, uh, in the near future. So other than that, um, it kind of things just pop up and, uh, we take if them on. Have a link to the, to the, the nature article. Um, that you're doing because that's more for public consumption um if you get me the yes. link i'll probably i'll make sure i share that with with uh, my students if they're interested because i i do uh uh daily like scientist profiles um and you were on there so um, i think they might be interested to see uh you know what you're you're doing um i like Absolutely. to share that with students so um i did find your wonderfest thing because i googled you so <laughs> Nice. Nice to know it shows up. <laughs> There's a couple other programs of Washingtons out there that uh, take search uh, results sometimes. So. It's important to have those so like students don't see the other stuff you've done that's a little further down in the searches. So you got to have that good stuff up there on top in Google. <laughs> oh yeah, you got to have the buffer. So I got all kinds of stuff now above whatever I did in college. So uh, that's way up there. So this was uh, an excellent talk. Thanks for thanks for hanging out and telling us all about your research. And uh, now, I I want I want to talk about one other thing before you go. Um, and is there uh, a a particular um, thing that you like to say to to students? Um, as uh, you try to encourage their their science careers. Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, what what thing do I want to say? I could talk for hours about this, but when well, it really hours. comes down, uh, you you you, you, could, you could take as much you know some time. You don't have to take hours though. Yeah. No, I, I, but when it really comes down to it, I guess what I want to share with um, with students is. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the sort of academic environments like college and, and whatnot aren't, uh, in my opinion, as well structured as they should be um, to inspire us and facilitate us to do these kind of, for me, what are really engaging and fun parts of science, like research. Um, and so a large part of being able to do this and, and, and kind of being in this environment that uh, trains you and teaches you how to be a scientist, truly, outside of just being able to say stuff in the classroom, um, you kind of have to go out and, and find on your own um, just a little bit. So if you are looking to go to college um, or community, uh, like whether it be four year or community college, both um, have these opportunities. Um, definitely, if, if you're interested in doing research, if you're interested in pursuing a topic more, 
um, try and meet with your uh, professor of like one of your introductory courses, or if you're taking a class that you're really interested in, you know, uh, try and talk with that professor and meet with that professor um, and ask them, you know, what kind of research is going on or, or where you as an undergrad um, might uh, have space to help out. Uh, and also, uh, I know some campuses have uh, organizations that are like especially um, made for getting undergrads into the research process and, and kind of making sure that they're mentored properly through this and, and they have resources they need. Um, so I guess the, the, the first part of this is like when you get to college, um, uh, college is more than just going through classes, even though classes is a lot of college, uh, you know, and, and really take the time to like figure out what opportunities are on campus. Because um, for me, honestly, like 80% of what I took classes on, it was fun to learn, but I, you know, what I did with research and stuff, I just kind of stumbled onto when I was on campus is the reason I'm doing what I'm doing now. Um, and then I guess my add on to that is, uh, especially as a researcher, and especially if you're going into, um, you want to go eventually go on to grad school or something like that, um, science, the, the uh, science environment is not great at reinforcing uh, that you belong here and that, you know, you're, you're doing it, you're successful, that, that you are contributing to this process. Um, it's kind of like, uh, I guess the American analogy is playing baseball. We're playing a game of failure here, right? If you bat a 30%, that's great. Um, you're, uh, you're doing really kind of difficult things that not a lot of people know about um, really well. Uh, and so just you being there and just you being able to operate in that space is in and of itself commendable accomplishment. Um, and so, you know, just reaffirming that inevitably you'll probably feel down in college or if you go into research, you'll feel down in the research space, um, but you're capable. And, you know, that really excited, engaged, uh, you know, kid, um, that you were in high school or middle school, or even if you weren't, you know, the really uh, wherever you were and you were excited and engaged, um, that person is still there. That person, uh, you know, is, is still operating in this, even if you don't feel that at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're these you're definitely able to do stuff in these spaces, um, and a lot of it just comes down to finding the right people and finding the right opportunities. And so keep your eyes and ears out. Um, I'm here as a resource, you know, I don't know how long I'll have my Berkeley email, but uh, you're welcome to Google Lorenzo Washington Berkeley um, and hit me up on email or hit me up on Twitter, swanky kind of guy. Uh, and I'll, I can talk with you about any questions you have too. But um, yeah, being in science is awesome. It's not always uh, as fun as it should be, but even when it isn't fun, it's nice to remember that at the end of the day, you're still doing really cool stuff um, and you still deserve to be here, regardless of how you feel right now. So. Well said. Um, and I think it's important to note the idea of the imposter syndrome, which I think is what you're alluding to, where you might think like you don't belong. And that, that's in a lot of fields, especially when you're, you know, getting up in your career um, and you're doing things like you said that are really hard um, and not many people are doing it's easy to feel like you don't belong um, and i think you know a lot of students you know have that feeling um, especially you know if you're the first one in your family that's gone to college i know a lot of students you know are like that where um, they're one of a few in their family that have gone to college and it's easy to feel like you know you don't belong um, but like you said, looking out for those support structures, being proactive in your academics. Um, I know a lot of people that have been successful because they did that. And lo and behold, you go to your professor and they're, no one is there for office hours. <laughs> right? <laughs> you ever have a pro you go um, you're like, you're like, oh, when can I sign up for office hours? You're like, no, don't worry about it. No one shows up. <laughs> you're like, really? Okay. A <laughs> hundred and whatever kids in this class and I'm the one kid at office hours, you know? And so you got to look for that. Right. It's kind of uh, you know, amazing to think of that, you know, those things are the case, but you got And I think you also alluded to finding your passion, um, you know, finding what you're interested in. And I think it's OK, especially as an undergrad, if you don't know, like you changed. Right. You went in thinking animal science 
you know, I don't feel that if you change that you've somehow lost your way. Um, I think it's, it's, it's okay to change your interests, especially in science. So many people like take complete left turns or right turns, you know, it's just, oh. um, doing this, nope, this way, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> you, you start doing, you find a passion and, you know, if you're interested in something and you're, uh, then you can pursue it. Absolutely. Everyone brings an interesting perspective to these things. Um, and all the knowledge you've accumulated is somehow important and relevant, believe it or not, like just the way you think about things. Um, everyone's a little different. And when we're doing research, the more perspectives, uh, in my opinion, often the easier it is to, to get through all the hard and nitty gritty stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. That is true. That is true. So any final words? If not, we were going to go uh, find someone else to raid tonight. I don't know who else is on. Okay. We can we can harass. Um, yeah. But uh, no, thank you for having me on and, and being willing to talk with me and, and uh, about my research and about my my path and process through science. Uh, it's a good time. I always like talking about this stuff. So I do too. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> who would have thought? Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be in touch. Um, what is this uncle bill? There's no other science streamers on tonight that I'm actually following. This is like, this is weird for me. Um, I know there's some that you, you follow that I don't. So, um, oh, that's politics. I don't want to go into politics. Ugh. Let's go to the politics stream. Yeah, I'd rather look at microscope pictures for another few hours. <laughs> That's how you spend your your Wednesday night looking up microscope pictures. Do you ever? I actually had uh, uh, Christopher King was on a few weeks ago, and you know he's a the histologist, and you know he does artwork using different staining techniques and crystallization, um, and he produces some beautiful, you know, uh, artwork, you know, using you know a micro light microscope and some phase contrast and you know it's a wonderful uh art microscopy is uh you know is it's awesome oh, stuff yeah. so i love uh, i love seeing the little like how scientists make like you make art on petri dishes and with like the microscope mm -hmm. images because it's because I, I do like some photography stuff on the side um, and how I take pictures on the microscope is a hundred percent benefited from me having taken time to become a better photographer. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it's, it's all art. Yeah. All right. That sounds good. So check me out. I believe that's the one uh, uncle bill was talking about i have actually not followed check me out yet she's doing a health stream she's talking to people about healthy living so we can go raid her and have uh, and learn about healthy living which is good and everyone else next stream will be uh Friday, I'm going through a uh, Subnautica playthrough with one of my students, and uh, we're more than halfway done with the game as we learn about marine biology and uh, attempt to stay alive in an underwater world. So that'll be the next stream. And thank you for being here. Please hang out as we check me out um, in about five seconds. And please help say hello to her and uh, be healthy and be well. All right. You know, getting a personal trainer or seeing a dietitian, whatever it is, these are all just ideas. We're talking.